Hello, it's Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with UFO Headline News. According to EarthSky.org, before dawn this morning, if you looked very low to the east shortly before sunrise, you could see the extremely thin waning crescent moon and that elusive planet Mercury. And they're going to be close together, but will they be as close together as they were in 2016? That's the question. The answer is no. In this case, the moon is going to sweep 1.6 degrees south of Mercury. That's about three moon diameters. Still, if you manage to catch them before dawn, they will be beautiful. If you look eastward, you'll notice a bright object. That will be Venus, which is due to shine in our dawn sky for most of the rest of this year. Mercury and the moon will be lower in the sky than Venus. Mercury is fainter than Venus, but it's still pretty bright for being so low in the sky and so close to sunrise. The moon has been shifting down in the east before dawn, sweeping past Venus and getting closer to Mercury for these past few mornings. The farther south you are on the Earth's globe, the bigger advantage you have in seeing the moon and Mercury. That's because these two worlds will rise earlier with respect to the sun, but from more southerly latitudes. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's always near the sun in our sky, so it shifts between morning and evening skies. It's been up before dawn now through the month of May, but again, the southern hemisphere has had a better view. Have you seen Mercury this month? If you have and you have photos or comments, earthsky.org wants to hear from you. Bottom line, the farther south you are on the Earth's globe, you're going to have a bigger advantage in seeing the moon and Mercury. And if stargazing is part of your agenda, well, here's something else from earthsky.org. Which moon phase is best for stargazing? And the answer is, it depends on what you want to do. Some people enjoy watching the moon itself as it waxes and wanes in our sky. Some enjoy the fact that the moon appears near bright stars and planets at certain times of the month. For instance, over the past several mornings, there's been that moon slipping down toward sunrise, edging toward the next new moon, that'll be May 25th, and passing the planets Venus and Mercury in turn. Again, it's going to be seen better in the southerly latitudes than the northerly ones. Most professional astronomers don't care about observing the moon itself. Most are more interested in observing objects in space much farther away than our moon. So they look forward to moon-free nights, which let them look at deep sky objects such as galaxies, star clusters, and nebulae. They like the moon at or near new phase. It's best to look at these faint fuzzies in the night sky with little or no light. Amateur astronomers using telescopes may also try to avoid that pesky moon because its glare interferes with the telescopic views of deep sky objects. Especially around the time of the full moon, that moon casts a lot of light, washing out many nighttime treasures. At new moon, the moon is up during the day, not the nighttime. Around then, you won't see the moon at all. Not unless you're in the right spot on Earth to watch that solar eclipse, Mm, like the one that's much heralded for August 21st, 2017. That'll be the first total solar eclipse visible from the contiguous United States. It'll likely be one of the most viewed eclipses in history. We will give you a heads up before the fact, don't worry. In the meantime, what do we have to look forward to in the days ahead? Nothing less than the closest supermoon of 2017, which comes not with a full moon, but with the May 25th new moon. Nope, you won't see it. It's a new moon, and therefore it's hidden in the glare of the sun, but it's going to bring higher than usual tides. Bottom line, the best phase of the moon for stargazing depends on what you want to do. Some enjoy watching the moon itself. On the other hand, people using telescopes avoid the moon because its glare interferes with watching deep sky objects. Speaking of objects in the sky, it's the International Space Station in the news. Here's an article from Reuters with a byline for Irene Klotz. Headline, NASA plans emergency spacewalk on International Space Station. This story broke on Sunday. Here we go. A pair of astronauts will venture outside the International Space Station as early as Tuesday, that's today, for an emergency spacewalk 
to replace a failed computer, one of two that control major United States systems, and it's aboard that orbiting outpost. The primary device failed on Saturday, leaving the $100 billion orbiting laboratory to depend on a backup system to route commands to its solar power system, its radiators, cooling loops, and other equipment. The station's current five-member crew from the United States, Russia, and France were never in any danger, according to NASA. NASA expects to make a decision later, and they probably have done that by now, about which astronauts aboard the station will make that two-hour spacewalk and when the assignment will take place. Peggy Whitson, who is currently the station commander, assembled and tested a spare electronics box to replace the failed device. That device had been installed during a spacewalk March 30th, said NASA spokesman Don Huot. NASA's last emergency spacewalk took place December 2015, At that time, two United States astronauts left the station to release the brakes on a robot arms mobile transporter. The International Space Station, staffed by a rotating crew of astronauts and cosmonauts, serves as a research laboratory for biology, life science, material science, and physics experiments, as well as astronomical observations and Earth remote sensing. The station is owned and operated by 15 nations. It flies about 250 miles, 400 kilometers above Earth, and orbits our planet about every 90 minutes. It has been continuously staffed by rotating crews of astronauts and cosmonauts since 2000. You can bet that here at UFO Headline News on Inception Radio Network, we will keep you in the loop. Here's a cool headline. New Telescope has already found three rare mystery signals. We grab this headline from the website CNET. Michelle Starr, with two R's, gets the byline. The Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder is poised to make history if it helps solve the origin of FRBs, fast radio bursts. That system is already making tremendous leaps forward. Within four days of being switched on, the radio telescope array detected its first fast radio burst. It's an FRB. These radio signals are unsolved space mystery. Not only extremely powerful, they last just milliseconds. It's rare that they repeat, which makes them very hard to predict or locate. Until the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, they spell that A-S-K-A-P, started scouring the skies. Only 23 FRBs had ever been found, and most of those were identified as previously recorded data. The radio telescope array discovered not only one FRB, but three, and it only used eight of its 36 dishes. Here's a quote from Keith Bannister. He's Australia's Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization head. They led the work. He said, quote, With ASCAP, we can find an FRB every couple of days, and that number will increase very quickly now that we've got our technology working, end quotes. The key to the discovery is a new type of radio telescope technology. It's called the phased array feed. Most telescopes only look at one area of the sky at a time. This phased array feed, with each camera made up of 188 receivers, allows the researchers to look at 240 square degrees of the sky, pointing the dishes in different directions. These researchers come from CSIRO, Curtin University, and the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. It's this wide field of view that gives the ASCAP the edge on FRB detection. In 2020, there's going to be something else, the Square Kilometer Array, That's a telescope that's going to do pretty much the same thing, only better. The applications are huge for astronomers around the world. Firstly, there's the statistics of the FRB population, such as the ratio of bright signals to faint signals. This will help study whether the FRBs are nearby or if they're affected by the age of the universe. Secondly, the team will add an extra mode to help pinpoint with greater accuracy where those FRBs originate, which could finally explain what causes them. The problem right now, Bannister said, is there's no theory that explains what has been observed. He said, quote, To make a fast radio burst, and to make it visible because it's coming from such a long way away, it has to be really bright. So if it's coming from so far away... 
then the question is, how does something make something so bright that it can be seen from so far away? End quotes. He has a few ideas. Here's one, quote, the things we know of that generate similar sorts of emissions are, for example, pulsars and magnetars, end quote. But he said pulsars and magnetars can't be detected in other galaxies, quote, and yet we detect FRBs that we think are in other galaxies. So we think it's probably not the pulsars or the magnetars that we see. But then if it's not that, what is it? He finished. The finding of the first FRB, called FRB 170107, was published Monday in the journal The Astrophysical Journal Letters. The other two, at the time of this writing, are yet to be published, but they and many others will be coming soon. Said Bannister, quote, This is just the beginning for ASCAP system, and there's going to be a lot more coming out of the telescope in the next 12 months, end quotes. We'll keep you posted. Here's another mysterious, wonderful thing from the website NewScientist.com. Headline, Weird Energy Beam Seems to Travel Five Times the Speed of Light. This is written for Astrophile by Joshua Sokol. It's a monthly column on curious cosmic objects, and that certainly fits in right about here. Here's what Joshua Sokol writes. Please welcome to the stage a master illusionist, an energy beam that stabs out of galaxy M87 like a toothpick in a cocktail olive, is pulling off the ultimate magic trick, seeming to move faster than the speed of light. Almost five times faster, in fact, as measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. This feat was first observed in 1995 in galaxy M87, and it's been seen in many other galaxies since. It might have you questioning your entire reality. Nothing can break the cosmic speed of light, right? You just can't flaunt the laws of physics now, can you? If you want to enjoy the illusion from your seat in the audience, stop reading. Otherwise, Joshua Sokol welcomes us backstage to look at how the trick works and how it's helping astronomers to understand the fate of entire galaxies. We've known about the jet of plasma shooting out of the core of M87 since 1918, when astronomer Heber Curtis saw a ray of light connected to the galaxy. To be visible from so far away, it had to be huge, about 6,000 light years long. As modern astronomers know now, pretty much all galaxies have a central black hole that periodically draws in stars and gas clouds. When gas begins to swirl down the drain, it heats up, and magnetic fields focus some of it into jets of hot plasma. These jets shoot out at velocities near to, but not faster than, the speed of light. To understand the illusion, Joshua Sokol suggests we picture a single glowing blob of plasma starting at the base of this path and emitting a ray of light, both of which travel towards the Earth. Now, wait ten years. In that time, the blob has moved closer at a sizable fraction of the speed of light. That gives the rays emitted from that later position a few light years head start on the way to us. If you compare the first and second images from Earth's perspective, it looks like the blob has just moved across the sky to the right. But because that second position is also closer to us, its light has had less far to travel than it appears. That means... It seems to have arrived there faster than it actually did, as if the blob spent those ten years traveling at a ludicrous speed. That jet from M87 is more than just a curiosity, according to Eileen Meyer at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. All over the universe, outflows of energy from massive black holes can stop or start the formation of stars throughout galaxies. But it's unclear how these outflows work and how much energy they contain. By appearing to move faster than light, jets such as the M87 one change visibly over just a few years, and that's unusual for distant objects like galaxies. That allows astronomers to make precise estimates of how fast the plasma is moving and thus how powerful the process is. M87 is special because it's relatively close compared to other galaxies, and that makes it easier to study. 
In 1999, astronomers used Hubble pictures of the jet taken over four years to see that plasma ripple outwards. Eileen Meyer from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, lengthened that search to 13 years of images. These images seem to show that the plasma might also be moving in corkscrew-like spirals, as if it wasn't complicated enough. These fresh results from Eileen Meyer, now being prepared for publication, extend the baseline again to a total of more than two decades and may offer new surprises. She said, quote, over 20 years, you know, things go bump in the night, end quote. And although the faster-than-light effect is old hat to her, she still stops to appreciate it sometimes. Most things we see traveling across the sky, such as planets and comets, are close to us. But M87 is tens of millions of light years away. She said, quote, we can see over a human lifetime things moving, which is crazy, end quote. Crazy indeed. Crazy cool. Crazy science. It seems to be there's a lot of trouble in the area of funding for anomalous studies, etc. Here's a headline from Nine News out of Australia. Porter probes public funding for UFO group. There isn't any byline here, but we're gonna read it anyway. Here we go. A group of UFO enthusiasts has come crashing to earth with a federal minister ordering an urgent probe into their taxpayer funding. It's the Tuggera Lakes UFO Group, perhaps Tuggera, it's spelled T-U-G-G-E-R-A-H. It's on the north-southwest central coast of Australia, and it's pocketed nearly $6,000 in government money since 2013. Social Services Minister, a man named Christian Porter, whose department dishes out the volunteer grants, is in disbelief. Quote, the minister is somewhat surprised at the nature of this particular volunteer group being funded through this grant program, end quote. That's Mr. Porter's spokeswoman. She continued, quote, He has instructed his department to hold the transmission of funds pending a re-examination of the application by the department, end quote. The group, which has more than 800 members on Facebook, is said to share news and information of UFO matters and support friends, and it has networks. Quote, the minister's office has been advised that this group was previously funded under the Labour government in 2013 and that some of this grant goes to the transport costs of volunteers with a disability, end quotes, Mr. Porter's spokeswoman said. Hmm, seems downright draconian to this broadcaster. We'll keep our eyes on the area of Tagura, Tagura, Australia and see how this works out. Well, there's another sighting in Chicago. UFOstalker.com brings us this. It's MUFON case number 83883. Now, we'll leave it to you, gentle listeners, to decide, is this another Chicago Owl Man sighting? The date of this sighting is the 19th of May. It wasn't reported till the 21st of May, both in this year. Summary, two large bat-like things flying together. Sighting specifics, the viewing distance a little uncomfortably close, 21 to 100 feet, the altitude 500 feet or less. Sighting duration, one minute. These objects featured appendages and wings. The flight path was path with directional change, and according to our submitting witness, the object shape does not apply. The weather at the time of this event was a maximum temperature in Chicago of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, dropping down to 43 degrees Fahrenheit, 6 degrees Celsius. The maximum visibility was 10 miles, 16 kilometers, down to a minimum of 2 miles, 2 kilometers, and it was raining. Here's the report. I was out at the breakwater with my best friend and her boyfriend, and we were waiting for my boyfriend to finish helping his dad tie the boat to the dock. They helped us bring the boat to the marina for the summer. We were standing on the shore by some picnic tables, waiting for James to meet us there. We were just talking when we heard this loud screech. It sounded completely out of this world. And after a couple of seconds, we heard another one, only louder and a higher pitch than the first one. So we looked around, we were thinking we'd heard an animal in distress and wondering whether it needed help. 
That's when we saw this large bat fly into our view. It was black, and it came from the direction of the bridge that holds up the ISD. It flew low, and then it shot up into the air as it came over the water. We noticed one of the Coast Guard helicopters was flying over the water about the same time, but we're not sure if it saw this thing, as the thing kept on flying. The bat flew a large circle. It cried out again, and almost instantly, it was joined by another large bat. These things were big. They stood out against the sky. They flew figure eights around each other. It looked as if they were dancing in a strange sort of way. It was actually quite beautiful, considering how freaking strange it was. About that time, my boyfriend walked up to us and scared the living bejesus out of us. Both myself and my friend screamed, and I think those large bats heard us, because they screeched back at each other and both flew down toward the water. It looked like they were going to slam into the water, and at the last second, they pulled up and flew toward, and I'm assuming, under the bridge and out of sight. We ran toward the railing, looked down the river, and saw nothing. This entire encounter lasted about one and a half to two minutes. It was scary, only because we didn't know what the hell they were. But it looked like they were interested in each other and not us. We can't have been the only ones to see it, as the river walk and the pier were full of people and joggers. Are these things just giant bats? Or are they gargoyles? Or are they just people in those wingsuit thingies? asks our witness. Well, we're asking all kinds of questions. Was it connected? Is it connected to the Owl Man sightings in Chicago just a while back? These were described as bats, but then again, that screeching seems more owl like to this broadcaster. At any rate, let's take wing, shall we, and head down to Albuquerque, New Mexico for this sighting. It's move on case number 83873. The date of this sighting is May 20th, 2017. It got a next day report. Here's what our witness reports as summary. Ten orange orbs of indeterminate size slowly moving across horizon. Sighting specifics. Viewing distance 501 feet, eventually becoming one mile. The altitude unknown. Sighting duration five minutes. Object features unknown. This object flew in a straight line path, and it was shaped like a sphere. No meteorology, but here's the report. My wife and I saw ten orange orbs to the west from our balcony on Montano and Golf Course Street at about 30 degrees angle. So we got in our car and attempted to follow these objects west. We overtook them between the golf course and Montano. We saw two or three to the south and two to the north. I was driving, my wife was passenger, and as we drove underneath the flight path of these objects, she looked north and saw one of the orbs eject another object. This one had two rows of lights, either three or four lights in each row. One row was red, the other green. She said this other object hovered for a few seconds and then dropped quickly. I turned south and saw two of the orbs to the east, turned east on a cross street, but by that time all the orbs were gone. And we ask, gone, to where? One of the big questions involved in this mystery, where do they come from and where do they go? Oh, also, what do they want? We're not going to find out today because we just noticed all the clocks on the wall indicate in every time zone we've got to fly because... That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow today's broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow.